Good evening and welcome. My name is Karen Marcinkiu. I'm Program Manager with the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our evening of education called Walking Through Grief and Loss with the COVID-19 Lens, Strategies for Survival with presenters Lorraine Holslander, Shelley Peacock, Jill Bally, and Joel Gajardasing. Jill is not able to be with us, unfortunately, tonight. However, you will be able to see her in a recorded session later tonight. We want to thank our sponsors. The Evening of Education is brought to you by our presenting sponsor, SGI, and proudly supported <laughs> by SaskTel Telcare and Our Lady of the Prairies Foundation. Before we begin, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. We will be recording tonight's session and it will be available online at a later date. None of the attendees names will be shown as part of the recording and, and don't worry your video um, isn't showing up either, just the presenters. Um, along with your Zoom link for tonight's session, you should have received a copy of the presentation. The presentations will be about an hour or so, followed by a question period. Um, please type your questions into the button near the bottom of your screen marked Q&A, not the chat part, um, and just identify who the question is for in that part as well. That's the only way we'll be taking questions this evening, just in the Q&A part, so typing it. We will have moderators who will read, summarize, and ask the questions to our presenters at the end. Uh, we would ask that you keep your questions relevant to the topic being presented tonight. And if you have other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to society staff at one of the seven resource centers across the province or by calling the Dementia Helpline. Prior to the presentations, I'm going to provide you with a quick overview of who we are and what we do at the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. Our vision is a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Our mission is the ASOS empowers all people to live well with dementia while funding research into prevention, cures, and quality of life. It's a board-directed charity um, incorporated in 1982. A person does not need a formal diagnosis to be connected to us. We support those affected by Alzheimer disease and other dementias and have resources and knowledge about many types of dementia. What can clients expect from the Alzheimer Society of Saskatchewan? Individualized connection and service, individualized information and support available for both the person with dementia and the care partners. We work with each individual client and learn their stories and provide the right information, support and strategies pertinent to each person's situation. Um, there's learning opportunities. We offer a number of learning series courses to help people with dementia, their families and friends to live as well as possible with dementia. The courses offered build upon each other covering the continuum of the disease. We also hold evenings of education like tonight throughout the year. They are on standalone topics presented by content experts. Connections, uh, support groups, Alzheimer Society support groups offer a chance to exchange information with others living with and affected by dementia, access the most current information, learn and share practical tips for coping with change, decrease feelings of loneliness and isolation, express feelings and find a sense of hope. Minds in Motion is a two hour weekly program that combines physical activity and social activity for those with early stage dementia and a friend, family member or caregiver. Connection to other organizations. This includes providing information on available services provided by the Saskatchewan Health Authority, other government agencies and lists of private or community based organizations that help support people's dementia journey. I would now like to introduce tonight's speakers. Lorraine Holtzlander is a registered nurse and a professor at the College of Nursing at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Lorraine worked as a palliative home care nurse for 17 years. Her research focus is mainly on grief and loss and supporting family caregivers during bereavement. She teaches community nursing and qualitative research methods. Shelley Peacock is a professor in the College of Nursing at the U of S. 
and has been a registered nurse for more than 20 years. I actually was in my master's with her, so it's awesome. Her teaching in the college includes classes in foundational nursing skills and qualitative research approaches. Shelley's research is focused on the well being of persons living and dying with dementia and supporting family carers. Jill Valley is a registered nurse and associated professor in the College of Nursing, U of S. Jill's research focuses on exploring the experiences of and developing supportive care for families of children who have life limiting and life threatening illnesses. Jill has lived experience of loss and grief after caring for her mom who was diagnosed with rapidly progressing mixed dementia. We also have a special guest presenter, Joel Gajadar Singh, who will be introduced in an upcoming recorded presentation on personal lived experience. I would like to give a warm welcome to tonight's speakers. We're so appreciative you are sharing with us tonight, with us tonight. All right, so now uh, we'll go to our presentation and Lorraine will just get it loaded on the screen here. Sorry, are you seeing the right one here? Oh, I gotta switch somewhere. Yeah, I think you need to switch. Which the switch button was there before. I'm just oh, there, the it is. there it is. Yeah. Okay, I got her now. Okay, and I better put my camera on me. Whoops, do I need to um, turn my camera on too? I think Carly will, um, Carly, will you be able to get Lorraine's video going? Okay. Oh, maybe I can do it now. I see a button here, but there we go. There we go. All right. I think we're good to go. Shelly and I are going to start us off here and um, um, just uh, want to give you uh, or just wanted to say thank you so much for being here tonight and for uh, attending this seminar and first of all we want to acknowledge that we live learn and work on traditional indigenous territories and we pay our respects to the first nations metis and inuit ancestors and affirm our commitment to respectful relationships with others and with this land. And especially as we reflect, we reflect um, uh, on September 30th will be the very first national day of truth and reconciliation. And so we remember and honor the survivors of res residential schools and their families. Thank you also very much to the Alzheimer's Society for inviting us and for recognizing, you know, as we do how important grief and loss and taking time to think and, and to walk through those concepts, how important that is right now. And especially so in the time of pandemic and there's been a lot of grief and loss. So for tonight, uh, what we wanna do is just um, really take some time and reflect on the types of grief and loss that people have experienced during the pandemic and beyond. And, and this was probably optimistic when I wrote this because uh, we're not through the pandemic yet. Hopefully, maybe we're halfway or something, I don't know. But we also wanna look at just how that pandemic has affected families living with dementia, including those in the community and those in long-term care homes too. And then learn about some tools and strategies to build coping and resiliency during grief. And then we've been gifted with um, a, a really personal journey of a family member diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and how a spouse and a daughter coped with those personal losses. And um, surprise, surprise, Jill and Shelly and I worked together quite a bit at the U of S. And so when uh, Karen approached us, I thought, oh, right away, we've got a team up here. And um, Jill and her dad have uh, a really powerful story to tell. And I think in many ways it really, it, it can teach us a lot of lessons and help us apply 
some of the theories that we're going to be looking at as well. So first of all, let's just sort of take a look what we mean. What, what is grief and loss? Um, what are the different types? And, and uh, part of the reason is just that we need to you know, find it to, to be able to recognize it in ourselves and in others. So you might want to just think uh, for a minute, what losses have you experienced? over the last 18 months or so of the pandemic, which about, you know, March of 2020. Uh, many people have lost family members, people, even pets in that time or their own health or having to move. I think almost all of us have lost out on family gatherings and um, plans for the future, traveling. A lot of things had to be put on hold and, you know, those are all losses and Grief is then the way we respond to that loss. Um, and the process of grieving is important because it can help us to learn how to cope with that change. It's a, it's a mechanism we have to kind of get through hard times. Um, so just think about maybe how you, how did these losses affect your life? You know, there are some losses that are catastrophic, life-changing, and some that are, um, you know, not as life altering. And then some can even be a relief when they happen, some of these changes that have happened in the pandemic. Um, but uh, what's really crucial in this time is that being able to grieve and finding support has been really impacted um, by the restrictions, by not being able to get together, um, even to have funerals for people. And so we recognize that I think there's going to be a buildup and a, a backlog of the grief that we should be um, dealing with and processing, but um, it's hard to do when you have multi griefs. So just a little bit about what, what grief is and um, just to sort of help understand maybe what type of grief you might be feeling or maybe what type of grief that you might see around you. And there is such thing like we call normal grief because we all react in some ways to a loss and it requires us to sort of build that resiliency or you know process it in order to stay healthy and to stay optimistic and so that would be kind of a normal grief but when we're talking about living with dementia there's a lot of anticipatory grief and that means grief that happens before the loss of that person but it can be a whole bunch of losses. It can be losses that you are anticipating, um, loss of relationships. So it's important to recognize that even though you might not have lost somebody, you might be feeling anticipatory grief. And then um, disenfranchised grief is also something that um, I think we're seeing more and more because we're supposed to not be affected when we can't go to the funerals, when we can't have, when we can't share our grief with people. And so we're kind of holding it in and and I think especially of any uh, healthcare workers that might be today in the seminar you might have gone through multiple deaths and uh, and not been able to grieve and um, maybe not had time to process it and so we call that disenfranchised grief because it's not that accepted but yet it's there and sometimes it can really affect people and then most importantly is like a prolonged or complicated grief and this is when grief comes, becomes disabling, intense. And um, it often does require support, professional support. And so, you know, if you feel like grief, uh, your own grief has been really disabling or someone around you, it's important to talk to somebody, to talk to maybe your doctor, to talk to people around you and to get some help. It's actually a, a diagnosis of that complicated grief. So, just to understand there's kind of a spectrum of what we mean when we say grief. So what does grief um, feel like and, and look like? Uh, because we don't always recognize it either, but not everybody grieves the same way, of course. Some people feel very sad and angry and guilty and anxious and lonely and um, many feelings, sometimes even uh, yearning for that person or even a feeling of relief too. Uh, oftentimes, grief can be in our thoughts, like feeling confused, uh, feeling preoccupied. Your thoughts are kind of always going to the loss and to the person that you've lost. You may feel, you may think that uh, this isn't true, this isn't real, I'm not believing it, or thinking that things are hopeless. 
Uh, grief is in the body too. And that's very interesting, the physical feelings of grief. But um, I think most people that have been through it will say, you know, I, I felt it in my stomach. I felt it in my chest. I had trouble breathing, you know, difficulty sleeping, uh, just a lack of energy. And it's interesting that sometimes um, things will trigger this, right? Or anniversaries will sometimes like, why am I feeling sick today? And, and then you might think, you know, it's been, it's the anniversary day. So the grief is sort of uh, stored in our bodies somewhere too. And then also it's just our behaviors and some people, it is, it's just in their behaviors too, right? Just how they, how they act. And I, I remember I had a participant and the way she handled grief was like um, in one of my research studies with bereaved caregivers, but she, uh, tore apart her basement and rebuilt it up together. That was how she handled grief. So it was very much like she just had to do something. And uh, sometimes that's, um, might think of it as a male style. To what, what am I doing in my grief? That's, then that really does reflect a symptom of grief. So it's just important to identify maybe what's happening to us and to others around us and to, to even give that space that people need um, when they're grieving. Ambiguous loss is something that's often associated with dementia, and it's been called um, a constant yet hidden companion of dementia. So there's always kind of grief there. And it's kind of that ups and downs and different feelings in the journey. And you might think, well, I'm having a good day and then a bad day. And, it's, um, and then when you look back, you might see there's been quite a few losses and over time. And so maybe you want to, think about your own journey and kind of what losses you might have had to face in your journey with dementia. You know, right away, your some of your future plans have to change, your goals, your people's abilities to do things have changed. Um, and this can cause this ambiguous loss. So it can't be really identified, but it's just there. Um, but grief is important to help us to, you know, we have to think, I did lose those things. It makes me feel sad and just reflect on that. And then find your own way to, to move forward, not to move on or not to, not to say there is no grief, but how do I move forward in my grief? Um, there's many theories to sort of explain how we grieve. And, and I think just important because sometimes people get sort of uh, feeling guilty. They're not going through the stages or doing all the tasks. And so um, grief has been studied forever. Um, because it's such a problem for people. So research has been done. And of course, Kuba Ross was one of the first researchers that looked at actually stages of the dying process. But, but when she kind of identified that, you know, these feelings are what people go through, you know, denial and anger and bargaining and, and that. But important to remember, she was actually looking at what people had, had a diagnosis of a terminal illness. And then, but you know, I think it, she did help to kind of explain that people go through all these different processes. Um, Bowlby, he looked at attachment theory, and I think this is something quite important for caregivers, um, especially because, you know, when you're um, a caregiver to somebody, you get very attached and you get so close that that person almost becomes you in some ways. And so when you lose that person, that's an, a loss of that attachment that causes a lot of pain and a lot of grief. And so when your role as a caregiver is gone, um, you may have a, a really difficult time finding a new meaning and purpose in your life. I'm gonna look at the dual process model on the next slide, uh, but meaning making I think is something that we're even seeing in our um, presentation today because meaning just sort of asks, you know, what. How do I make meaning of the grief that I'm going through? And what's my story? And we're gonna hear a really great story of how uh, Jill and Joel kind of made meaning of the situation that they were in. And so many, it's, it's really a, a matter of finding what might work for you, what, what meaning can you find in your situation um, that maybe you can help other people. And, uh, by sharing it even with others like uh, Joel and Joel are going to do. And then continuing bonds, I'm gonna show you, but I'm just gonna show you this dual process model for a minute. And uh, it might help you if you're going through 
grief to kind of understand how um, your everyday life can be kind of a balance between these processes. And you might wonder why, why one day am I sad and crying and the next day I'm doing new things and, and then I'm going back to um, just kind of trying to relocate my life and then you're going back to even avoiding it completely. And yet research shows that a kind of a balance between those two approaches can be quite, um, quite good. Like, you know, you can't not do any of these things, but yet balancing back and forth between your loss and your moving forward can be um, a positive way to go through things. And of course, that's going to be different for everybody. And I think that's really important too, is that we don't expect people to do grief in one way, but that they're, um, they find their way through in their own unique way. Um, continuing bonds is another um, theory that builds on attachment. And uh, you probably know that when you've someone lost somebody, you still feel a bond to that person. You still keep them alive in their memories and uh, anniversaries. And it's research has shown that, you know, you don't need to move on, but that actually maintaining that bond has a benefit to you. And um, so I think, um, you know, whether it's like visits to the cemetery or um, different rituals, uh, that maintaining a bond with that person or that loss can actually be a positive um, for your grief. And just a quick, you know, overview of what grief and the has happened in the pandemic. And this is from some research from the states is that there's been a lot of losses without many opportunities to have support. Um, and this can make grief very difficult. It can re result in a stalled grief or a prolonged grief. And then it's important to pay attention to some of the risk factors for that. Like if people have all have had anxiety in the past or depression in the past, or maybe a sudden death or the loss of a partner, the loss of a caregiver, the role of a caregiver, those things can make grief more difficult. And still we have continuing isolation and loneliness and even fear of the disease. So what can we do? I think it's important just to listen to people to help them to tell their story um, and then recognize if it's become a prolonged grief that they need to get some professional help or maybe you need to get professional help. So we're just gonna look at more specifically switch gears here and Shelly's gonna talk about um, the effects of COVID-19 on families living with dementia. Thank you, Lorraine, I appreciate that sort of theoretical perspective about grief and loss. So moving on, um, regardless of where people with dementia may live, COVID has certainly impacted them in several, in several ways. So people living with dementia are among the most vulnerable to experiencing adverse outcomes from COVID, a COVID infection. And this is in large part due to the fact that they tend to be older, although not all people are, are um, older adults when they develop dementia, but they also can on occasion have other diseases and other conditions. And so we know that a COVID infection is particularly devastating to people that are older and have other health issues. And so that sometimes includes um, many people living with dementia. Another consequence might be, uh, certainly depending on the support that someone with dementia has, they may or may not have ready access to factual information about COVID. So it might be challenging for them to be able to follow the government updates. So they sometimes will show a video over Facebook. So unless someone has support to do that, they may not always have access to that ready information and keep, keep up to date about what's going on in our province about COVID. Owing to some of the consequences of dementia, especially for those that are in the later stages, might make it challenging for people to remember to maintain physical distance, to keep a mask on, or to wash their hands frequently. 
And so, of course, by not following these safeguards, uh, people can obviously increase their risk to COVID and people living with dementia might have a hard time following some of those things that are meant to protect them. Research shows that people living with dementia have experienced even more isolation than they did before COVID. And we knew there were lots of challenges even before COVID. And so this sense of isolation has likely increased and this will ultimately um, lead to a decrease in a family's well-being. Other consequences might be related to things like an increase in anxiety or apathy or irritability. And a lot of this is due to the limitations that are imposed from COVID, whether it's restrictions or the lockdown and those sorts of things. They can increase our and disrupt our sense of security. And so I'm sure with so many people joining this evening, there are many other consequences. And I'll just invite you to think about what might not necessarily be on this list, but that things that you might have experienced uh, since COVID began. So I'll just get you to go to the next slide, Lorraine. So when we look at families specifically living in the community, and I think it's really important to note and I'm sure many of you here are those kinds of families that make enormous contributions to support a relative or a friend who has dementia to live as independently as possible in their own home. And without a doubt, COVID has complicated this context. For instance, changes in home routines um, have increased the stress that families have experienced, particularly during lockdown, for example, during lockdown, families that normally relied on perhaps someone to watch their relatives so they could go out and run errands, that was no longer an option. So this disruption to their routine and lack of access to perhaps their social network um, may have likely increased their strain and is leading to burnout among caregivers. And some research sort of at this point uh, postulates that perhaps even once COVID is all done with, that the increased burden and strain and burnout that families are experiencing quite intensely now, there it might not be able to resolve and return to some level of normalcy as we were pre-COVID. Other situations included families moving their relative into their own home. In fact, there were some families that removed their loved one from a long-term care home because they were concerned about the care they might receive. Other family caregivers, other family members may have moved from their home into their relative or friend's home who's living with dementia. And they did this obviously to ensure that their loved one received adequate and sustainable support. And these changes to their living arrangements for some people, um, at least initially perhaps, might have been considered helpful in their caring relationship. On the other hand, for other people, it may have really disrupted their lives and certainly increased their strain and stress even more so uh, with COVID layered on that. Certainly the immediate shift to social and physical distancing meant that um, social and healthcare providers had to adapt to some form of remote delivery. So virtual or telephone appointments kind of became the norm in the first months of the pandemic. And it may be that that is even continuing more than a year on for, for some families. Um, and so although families weren't necessarily going in person for healthcare appointments, some families noted that it's actually kind of convenient to maybe talk to their G GP over the phone, share their concerns, and have some resolution that way, because it means 
They don't have to get their relative dressed. They don't have to get out the door and travel to the clinic. They don't have to sit in the waiting room. So there's, you know, this alteration to a remote delivery has some, some benefits, but not everything can be addressed virtually or remotely. And certainly things like day programs ceased almost instantly with lockdown. And this impacted many families absolutely enormously because they no longer had access to that respite, to that break for some hours during the week. And while a lot of day programs stayed connected to families, um, they still were not able to offer any in-person resources. And then for some, COVID-19 has really revealed the resilience amongst families and how they have sort of, you know, risen to the occasion and managed the crisis that COVID has imposed. So it hasn't necessarily been, you know, all negative, but it's really shown how families can, can come together and how resilient they are in supporting their relative with dementia. So if we think about going back to the notions of loss and grief, I think in this context in the community, some of the things that might fall here are things like family celebrations, birthdays or anniversaries, not being able to gather together as a family is not something we can get back necessarily, particularly because people with dementia progress and not everyone is stagnant in their, you know, um, in their memory and, and recognizing their family. So there's probably a lot of loss of that family gathering together in a much larger group and celebrating birthdays and, and those sorts of things. So I'll get you to switch the slide, Lorraine. It is, uh, I think goes without saying that long-term care homes were hit incredibly hard by COVID. Outbreaks were reported in many, many homes despite, you know, rigid I don't think it comes as a surprise to many people that staffing has long been an issue in long-term care and even before the pandemic and now it's sort of reached crisis levels in long-term care homes. And so people with dementia who live in long-term care homes often are in the advanced stages and that makes them a really vulnerable group. Families, um, regardless of their commitment and participation in care for their relative, were almost immediately locked out of long-term care homes. And that was in an effort to stop the spread or to introduce COVID into a home. And this is enormously distressing. Uh, I started a research study in February, 2019, before things got really bad. And it's a study, uh, where we were asking family caregivers with a relative in long-term care. Our study was not about COVID. It wasn't about the stress of this pandemic. And yet we had to entirely switch gears and hearing the devastation in families' voices when we're trying to research something else was really, really challenging. And it really horrible for families to not be able to be with their relative because they provided care, they provided companionship, um, and they benefited from that as much as their relative did. So a lot of families got a little bit creative and they resorted to other ways to be able to see their relatives. So you might have heard of some people doing window visits, for instance, which could be limiting depending what floor a, you know, their relative lived in. If it was on the main floor, not such a problem. In homes that are larger with second, third, and fourth floors, getting to the window, not so much. It also meant the staff probably had to help residents to get to the window to at least see and um, communicate with their relatives through the glass, which kept them safe and they at least could see each other, but it certainly is not the same as physically being together. Most homes developed outdoor visits when our weather got warmer. 
But of course, that still meant having to maintain physical distance, wearing masks. Um, it certainly was nothing like sitting next to their relative, holding their hand and hugging them. So there were ways to try to get families to be with their relative, but it was really quite tricky. And it was additional work for staff in long-term care that were already feeling additional stress and strain because now they no longer had family members there to help them with that important care that residents need. An exception to visiting in long-term care was around the end of life. So if there were residents that were dying, some homes allowed for one or two family members to basically come to the door, have a rapid COVID test, don PPE and go to their relative's room. And so it was, although a family member could access their relative while they were dying, it meant one or two. I have six brothers and sisters, and I have no idea how we could possibly decide which two of us would ever visit my mother if she were dying. I, so you can imagine, although there was access, it wasn't maybe ideal. Other consequences and things for people with dementia living in long-term care relates to things like residents having to physically isolate in their room because they may have been exposed to another resident or a staff member with COVID. And so to keep other residents safe, that meant they had to stay in their room. They were only visited by staff who were gowned and had masks on. And you can imagine how distressing that would be and then think of having dementia on top of that and maybe not understanding everything that's going on. So this certainly added to the isolation that many people with dementia are already experiencing. Sadly, um, research also shows that there was and perhaps continues to be an inappropriate and increased use of antipsychotic medications. Obviously, people with dementia, if they don't understand what's going on, they don't have the same routine, they aren't seeing their families, behaviors can result, and it's not through any fault of their own, it's the situation, um, but staff may have been resorting to using medications to, to try to manage that, to make up for not having enough staff or family present. And so we know because of the physical environment in long-term care homes combined with the frailty and vulnerability of residents, that means that deaths in long-term care homes in Canada contribute to um, almost 80% of all COVID deaths, which is uh, devastating. Um, I don't think we protected people in long-term care homes as best as we could. So certainly you can imagine then how COVID has impacted the end of life for families who have a relative in long-term care, if that was perhaps um, the consequence of their relative living there. So I'll get you to go to the next slide. Right. So I'll just invite you to think about the consequences of COVID maybe for yourself or for people you know, and unfortunately just how lasting that will be. So even when COVID is no longer an issue and who knows when that will honestly be, the effects of the lost time that COVID has imposed on families will be lasting well beyond when COVID um, is resolved. And so that's something to really consider and how that will influence people's sense of loss and, and grief and moving forward. So, I think we'll move now to um, briefly talking about some, some tools and strategies that you can consider when it comes to grief and loss. So I'll let Lorraine take over again. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult and it's kind of hard to um, come up with some solutions to all of this at this point, but here we are. And um, I think it is important that we try to find ways to cope and to, to get through this and to find maybe the meaning of it too. Um, but first step, really just acknowledging all these losses and in your life and um, in the people around you, I think is so important. And hopefully we find ways to recognize it in unique ways. Um, mygrief.ca is a really good website. 
um, put out by the virtual hospice and they have all sorts of grief resources and people to talk to, uh, videos, that kind of thing. Um, the Alzheimer's Society has uh, good information, especially about ambiguous loss. There is a, a link for that. I think in your handout, you should have that. Um, and just really important to reach out for support. If you are struggling, uh, reach out to somebody, talk to somebody and let them know. Um, even your, it's hard to talk to, to um, connect with people, but uh, make sure you do that. Reach out to your family or family doctor or your, um, people in your building, wherever you are, that uh, to let them know you think you need some help. Um, just taking care of ourselves, getting out for exercise and eating well is so important. Taking breaks from caregiving. Some people are doing this while caregiving and you might be caregiving yourself, as Shelley was saying, even more. Um, caregivers need breaks or they'll, it's almost impossible to stay as caregivers. So finding ways to take breaks uh, from that is so important. And I hope that you find, uh, and maybe at, um, at the end, we're gonna have a question period. And um, if you've thought of some ways that have helped you during grief, uh, you could maybe share it in the question and answer time at the end, um, because everybody's gonna find their own their own way to try to get through this. Lorraine, I'll just get you to advance the slide because I think you covered some content on slide 17. Oh, am I, is it, does it say hope now? Not on my screen. Uh-oh. Does it look like, it said, does it say hope now on yours? No. Oh. Afraid not. No, oh, is it okay? Um, the Alzheimer people. Karen, are you seeing uh, hope as a... Um, right now I see the re reflect on the consequences of COVID-19. Oh, hmm. Yeah, it's advancing on my computer, but it's not advancing. Let's just see. Okay. It's not going by tools and strategies. I don't know what the... Oh, my... Wait, no. It said my screen sharing's paused. Maybe if I, maybe that's why. I think I'm on a pause for my screen sharing. Oh, wait, resume share, I guess. Maybe that'll do it. It's got to look for the arrows, the directions. Is this okay now? Yeah, yeah we, we'll just get you back to the screen version. But yeah, it seems it's showing the next slide. Okay, there we go. All right, okay. So you just need to go to screen view. So I think you have to just switch your, your screen back so that the slide fills the window. Really? Is that better? It is indeed. Yep. I wonder you, if you want to go back. Um, yeah, it's kind of, is that it there? There you go. So you mentioned um, mygrief.ca and then walked through um, talking okay. all the way down to taking breaks from caregiving. So you could okay. probably go to the okay. next. Okay. Yes, it, it's very different now than what I'm looking at. That's okay. Uh, so um, hope is actually something that all of us have studied in our research as um, a way, something that I guess we'd say we all need. Um, and it's a coping strategy and hope is something that we need to look after. It needs to be protected and um, not, you know, uh, find ways to stay hopeful, I guess, staying positive about the future, um, but at the same time, giving meaning to what's going on in the present. And in my own research, I found that hope really is about that uh, kind of an inner strength and having trust in what's going on around you and there's some sense of control and that's what hope might, might mean. And uh, actually when I studied bereaved caregivers, they said they were searching for new hope. So when you were looking after somebody, your hope was really that they would be okay and that you would be a good caregiver and you would get them through. And then when the person um, died, you had to find new ways to do that. And sometimes that means finding a new purpose in your life and uh, new meaning for what you're going through. And there are some ways that we've even shown in research that could be helpful is just maybe even taking some time <clears throat> to
to self-reflect on your journey? What does that loss mean to you? What maybe is helping or hindering in your own grief? Uh, taking some time maybe to write your caregiving story. Uh, what makes you, what, what have you learned from being a caregiver? And then of course, so important to have a support network, um, to reach out and to stay connected. Found that hope is very dependent on having supports around you. And of course, we know that that's been extra difficult too. Uh, spiritual resources can be a source of hope. Uh, your beliefs, uh, meditation, trying to find ways to be in the now, which I think help, helps when you can get out in nature and take care of yourself physically. And of course, to take breaks, as I'm saying, and recognizing that that's even more important. And then Shelly's going to just talk about a few more approaches that we found in our research. As a result of COVID, the pandemic really demanded um, a change in thinking about how to support families living with dementia. Restrictions obviously meant that um, there were closed offices and other spaces. And so how we access families in a way provided us an opportunity to do things differently. And that's not to say there were not challenges with that, however, um, it sort of meant we had to shift how we provided support. So for instance, um, we saw an increase in the creation of virtual support groups to replace in-person meetings. And that meant perhaps people from different geographical locations could suddenly now attend one support group. So those are, you know, there are opportunities with that. Other options that were explored to socially connect people, for example, uh, the Saskatoon Council on Aging collaborated with the University of Saskatchewan and offered virtual activities. And one of them that I attended was um, a musician who was in a room with his guitar and in the chat, uh, the various people that were attending, much like this evening, uh, put in the chat and made requests. And because he was a gifted musician, he could play songs randomly. And for that hour, it was a nice break to get together. There were older adults, there were family caregivers there, and it was just a little interlude to have a break from the stress of, of COVID. And a lot of other types of social gatherings included things like cooking classes or art classes, those sorts of things. I've already mentioned this a little bit, but accessing healthcare uh, really changed because it meant there, were, there was a need for families to connect in, way, in safe ways to reduce their exposure. And so some families appreciate this idea of having um, virtual or telephone appointments because it meant they didn't have to then travel to the clinic. So it's not uh, lost on me, obviously, that being able to do things virtually means perhaps people have to learn something new or they have to be open and comfortable with technology in order to participate in these virtual ways. And that's more or less for different people. Obviously the people joining this evening have some level of comfort with technology and that's why you're here, but not everybody does. As well, not every family has a computer or a laptop or some other device in their home that makes virtual connections possible. So for instance, libraries had to close. Well, there were people that would go to the library to search the internet and those sorts of things. So. Although the, there, was an op, there is an opportunity for virtual connections, it still is limiting to those that have comfort with technology and those that have access to computers. So I'll just get you to switch to the next slide, Lorraine. Very briefly, some examples, for instance, of online resources um, outside of what might be offered. Um, through the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan include things like the Canadian Caregiver Network, for instance, has several online resources, many web-based 
supports, so specifically to be virtual and remote, and they address a variety of chronic conditions, but they also do have specific links to those that care for someone with Alzheimer's disease. So I put some of their um, web pages up there for you to see. Other types of online support, for instance, might include things like um, uh, at the Asant Cafe, which is the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and the Northwest Territories, houses a tool known as My Tools for Care. And that is open to any caregiver. You don't have to be a caregiver in Alberta. People from Saskatchewan or anywhere else in Canada can log in. And it was developed to support family caregivers to care for a relative with dementia who lives in the community. So that's one way um, to uh, access a resource that is available online. Another example is actually a tool that um, I was fortunate enough to develop and it's known as Reclaiming Yourself. And that is specific for bereaved um, spouses who had their spouse die of dementia. And so um, although it's available online, it's created in a way that you can download a PDF. So it's a writing tool, it's about journaling. And you heard Lorraine sort of talk about some of the ways to manage grief and loss or to um, perpetuate and then still hope is to write. And so that in some ways is what the Reclaiming Yourself tool is founded on. So you can type online, but then it is also as a PDF so that you can download it and use a pen and fill in and work on the activities that way. COVID has certainly increased and prioritized the work and research on all kinds of virtual or technology-based interventions. And so I understand next month, Dr. Donna Goodridge will be um, joining with the Alzheimer's Society to talk about an app that she has created for families living with dementia. So you can just see how COVID has really heightened the need to connect virtually and remotely with each other. And so certainly there will be continued uh, opportunities to access online resources to support you. In this presentation, we have explored uh, different types of grief and loss, considered how COVID has affected families living with dementia, briefly shared about some tools and strategies to build coping and resiliency. And so now we conclude with a presentation of a recorded talk from uh, a family with uh, a personal dementia journey related to grief and loss. And I'll just let Lorraine maybe offer a brief introduction to Jill and Joel. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'll just mention too that your last slide there has our resources and our references. Uh, but yeah, we're so um, uh, blessed and we've been gifted this presentation and um, they have pre-recorded it, but Dr. Go Joel Gishard Singh is um, on the call as well and will be available at the end of the presentation for questions and discussion. Uh, Dr. Jill Bally unfortunately ran into a, a travel glitch. She was supposed to be here, but uh, she'll be in the presentation. Uh, but uh, you can see this is um, uh, a daughter-father pair, and uh, they both are, our Dr. Joel is a professor emeritus from the University of Saskatchewan. So I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, you've already done this. Okay. And you can go ahead and show the presentation. Slander and Shelley Peacock. Holtzlander and Shelley Peacock. We'd like to start by thanking the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan and of course our co-presenters, Drs. Lorraine Holtzlander and Shelley Peacock. We also thank each of you for being here this evening and joining us for this presentation. So my name is Jill Bally and this is my dad, Dr. Joel Gajader Singh. And today we'd like to share with you our experiences as caregivers. We'll spend the first half hour or about half an hour discussing our experiences as families and family caregivers in providing care for my mom who is diagnosed with rapidly progressing mixed dementia 
in January of 2016. My dad will begin by telling you about their story so that you can get an understanding of who my mom was. And then he'll discuss the ways in which we experienced caregiving during the different stages of my mom's disease, including loss, grief, and hope. My dad will conclude with his final thoughts, and we hope to have some time for sharing, discussion, questions, and comments. So the overall lens of this presentation that Lorraine and Shelley have kindly shared with you was with regard to COVID and the pandemic that we've experienced over the last number of months. However, our experience occurred pre-pandemic, and so we are unable to share the COVID lens with you during this time, but do appreciate the level of complexity and the additional stress and difficulty that would have lent to the situation and your experiences. And perhaps when we have time to, to share and discuss, we'd be able to talk about some of those experiences that you've had during the pandemic. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences with the challenges of dementia. I would like to begin by giving you a brief background about my wife's life before and after dementia. My wife's name is Judy, and she and I were married 64 years ago. Judy was enrolled in the RN program at City Hospital in Saskatoon at that time. I was also an undergraduate student in the College of Education here at the University of Saskatchewan. Judy was unable to continue in her program at City Hospital because married students were not allowed to pursue studies in nursing at that time. So Judy became a full-time mother and raised our three children who have all become productive members of our society. Our oldest, Robin, is a retired geologist. Cameron is our second son, and he's a criminal lawyer living in Calgary. And Jill is our youngest, and she is a faculty, faculty member in the College of Nursing at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. We also have five grandchildren, Kara, Hayden, Tyson, Kali, and Lauren. And they were all Judy's pride and joy. 15 years after we were married, Judy decided to resume her nursing studies and enrolled in the nursing program in Lesbridge, where we were living at the time. She enjoyed every moment of her studies and excelled in each class. Judy completed her diploma, receiving six of the seven awards for academic excellence. Along with her love for her family, Judy was an avid reader and enjoyed walking, the outdoors, cooking, and going to the movies. Judy had a brilliant mind and a photographic memory. She remembered everyone's birth dates, anniversaries, and all other special occasions. In fact, she was the source of information for everyone. Upon returning to Saskatoon, I began working in the College of Education at the University of Saskatchewan, and Judy started her nursing career at the Regional Psychiatric Center, where she worked for five years. She then accepted an administrative position at the Veterans Home in Saskatoon, where she worked for almost 20 years. Judy retired in 1995, following an extremely successful career in nursing. That was a Judy I remember. She passed away on June 21st, 2017. When Judy passed away, the emotions attached to our loss were devastating. Our loss and the associated grief did not occur only 
at the time of Judy's passing. Instead, as Lorraine suggested earlier, we began to experience these emotions about five years prior to her passing. And those feelings of loss and the related grief appeared continuously throughout her illness experience. Our story really started when we all began to notice some subtle changes regarding Judy's memory. Because she had such a brilliant mind, this change was very obvious. And then it became more obvious when she started forgetting other things. At that time, I attributed this change to normal old age, and she and I often joked about its impact on us. At first, the changes were quite gradual, and Judy and I often rationalized them as a normal part of getting old. But she started forgetting dates, special occasions, and having a bit of trouble remembering words or labels for things. These subtle changes lasted for about a year and a half. And as I recall, in about 2014, things changed again. So during this time, as my dad has said, the changes that we were seeing in my mom were very subtle. And we did rationalize them as just being part of normal age and a normal aspect of healthy aging. And so at this time, there was really no real impact on our lives, and we carried on as per usual. A short time later, there was a noticeable rapid deterioration of Judy's memory and of observable physical, mental, and emotional changes. Judy began to have difficulty with her balance, and she developed a shuffling gait. She also had difficulties with performing daily routine things like dressing, brushing her teeth, and bathing. She also began misplacing things, such as her clothing, books, utensils, and other decorative items in our home. In addition, her eating habits also changed. I noticed that her long life healthy eating habits were now replaced with a preference for things she hadn't really enjoyed before, especially sweet things such as ice cream, cookies, and chocolate. Now that I look back at this time period, Judy's interests also changed. She no longer read with the same veracity. She was not very interested in some of her favorite TV shows. And she became a little more introverted, preferring to spend much of her time looking at photo albums, cards that we had received, and reading her daily journals from past years. At this time, Jill suggested that we have an assessment done and we consulted our family doctor who thought it was not necessary at this time. And this was postponed twice over the next year. Looking back, we wish we had trusted our own observations and persevered in order to obtain appropriate referral assessment and the kind of care that we knew Judy required. So at this point in my mom's illness and in our lives, the changes did require caregiving, especially vigilance to ensure her safety, and were cause for great concern. Looking back, we were experiencing frequent losses at this point and experienced resulting grief. Little by little, we were losing a sense of who my mom had always been. Routines in our life were changing dramatically. And with that came sadness and often confusion. We never knew what to expect next, but always held out hope, if only for my mom to be comfortable and for us to be able to keep her safe. As Judy's deterioration continued, we did return for the third time 
to the family doctor and requested a referral to a specialist with formal testing. Ultimately, this appointment was made for January 5th, 2016. We spent a half a day at, ge at the Geriatric Evaluation and Management Unit at City Hospital, where Judy underwent a variety of a uh, battery of tests with a variety of different healthcare professionals. Following the testing, Judy was provided with a diagnosis of rapidly progressing mixed dementia. Although one would think that given our experience up until that point, we would have been prepared for that diagnosis, I would venture to say that there is no preparation for such news. However, on the other side of that coin, there was knowledge and an answer for what was puzzling us, something tangible in all of the unknowns. We finally knew what Judy's illness was. And I think generally all three of us, my mom, my dad, and myself would say that this event the diagnosis was ingrained in our memory. As a nurse, I think my mom was well aware of what dementia and Alzheimer's meant and what the outcome would be. At the time, she said nothing could be worse. This may not sound right, but at the time and to this day, I'm thankful that my mom had no recollection of that day, for her illness was fairly significant by that time. For my dad and I, it certainly was a day of reckoning and one of real mixed feelings as he has suggested. The diagnosis itself presented a great loss as we were told the prognosis and were presented with a little bit of an idea of what was to come. But also the care, support and information provided to us that day brought awareness and hope for many things, as my dad has suggested that we didn't even really know at the time. One year later, almost to the day of diagnosis, Judy was transferred to a long-term care home. It was a tumultuous time in which I required hospitalization, leaving Judy under the care of Jill and her family. Given the emergent nature of this crisis, it was not possible to continue with our own care for Judy and therefore require the support of healthcare professionals. At this point, Judy had trouble with discerning food items on her plate and often declined a meal. We came to understand that this was not because she wasn't hungry, nor did she like the food, but because she couldn't seem to see or recognize the food on her plate. And this was followed by her inability to eat solid foods sometime later. Not only did Judy require full support with eating, she also required complete assistance with bathing, dressing, and walking. Now, Judy also had almost complete memory loss. I will now summarize our experience dealing with Judy's dementia. I would like to start with a description of the observable physical changes and losses as they occurred sequentially. The earliest was a gradual loss of memory and the accompanying tendency to deny this memory loss or the forgetfulness. This was followed by a rapid loss of memory, including such things as dates, places, people, and personal activities. Then there were repetitive questions. This involved an incessant, incessant questioning about anything that was encountered in day-to-day -day life. A phone call, for example, led to many different questions which were repeated over and over and over again. For me, this was very difficult and at times annoying, particularly in the beginning when I did not comprehend 
the gravity of the illness. Ultimately, I realized that this was an indication that Judy was confused and simply wanted clarification and reassurance. Judy's sleep habits changed markedly over time. At best, she would go to bed at about 8 p.m. and then she would awaken at midnight, at which time she stayed awake for the rest of the night. And then on the following day would take frequent cat naps. Her balance was also compromised at this time. And later on, she was unable to walk. While I knew that this affected my own sleep and rest, I did not realize the real impact that it had on my own health. At this point, there was the beginning of Judy's incontinence. This was very difficult for me as I had no experience in this area of caregiving. Judy was also throwing out many household objects that perhaps no longer meant anything to her or did not make any sense. This included books, pictures, jewelry, and utensils. Over time, there were significant losses given the changes in Judy's mental and emotional abilities and behaviors. For example, in relation to changes in Judy's verbal behaviors, there were times when she found herself trying to make sense of a chaotic world, she would verbalize her feelings in these ways. Something is happening to me and I don't know what it is, or I can't find the word. And will I get better? I am sad to say that in the beginning, I heard, but I failed to listen to her plea for help to make sense of a frightening world. I responded superficially to pacify her, not to help to untangle their chaos in her mind. Similarly, there were changes in Judy's emotional state. Her dementia had placed her in a chaotic, frightening world, which did not make sense. This led to frustration, anxiety, and fear. And these feelings reveal themselves in such things as facial changes, gestures, and other body language clues. At first, I miss these connections between Judy's mental state and the nonverbal clues that were observable. Now, as I look back, I did begin to notice them in Judy's eyes and in different facial expressions, gestures, and in her body language. The greatest fear of all was her fear of being left alone. She did not want to be left alone. She became clingy, almost childlike. As time passed, our world began to unravel. The pictures that you see here reveal this time in our lives a very fragmented life that was significantly unbalanced and seemed to pass by in a blur. Throughout this time, I was over overwhelmed and felt lost. The changes that were occurring in Judy and which impacted our lives were rapid, leaving no time to think about myself, my abilities to provide care for Judy, nor our vastly different life then and now. While perhaps at times we were coping and managing life, when I look back now, we were not. This was a tipping point, the point in time when I, when I had to come to terms with the biggest loss of all, moving Judy away from our home, but to a place where she could get professional health care and support we all required. In fact, as a family, it was very difficult to gauge and agree when professional help was needed 
and what that might look like. Did we get help in the home and by whom? Did we send, need to send Judy elsewhere for care? And if so, how did that work? Who was involved? And how did we ac access that support? There were often many questions, and at times the answer seemed so finite with no turning back. Lorraine described this feeling so well, and now I recognize that this was a time of ambiguous loss. Our losses were progressive, and as you can see, with many ups and downs. In this picture, we were touring a private care home to determine whether or not this may be a fit for us. Only moments later, the choice was taken out of our hands as I was taken to the emergency room and was hospitalized for 12 days. Fortunately, we were able to place Judy in the private care home until she was placed in a long-term care home only days later. I should point out that each perceived loss was accompanied by grief, which was sometimes fleeting, sometimes deep, and sometimes prolonged. But there was hope. Hope, an emotional experience, which ultimately supported all of us in coping and moving forward during Ju Judy's illness. Hope was also present and always changing. For example, at this time, my hope turned to a focus on improving Judy's daily life, knowing that professional care would keep her comfortable, while I also had hope that my own health would improve and my time with Judy would be better spent doing more meaningful things for her. But all things come to an end and Judy passed away on June 21st, 2017. Since my wife's passing, I have had time to reflect on our experience in dealing with her dementia. I now know that Judy was getting better help in a professional setting. And I have also learned that the greatest gifts that we as caregivers can provide are love, companionship, and patience. When I think about our experience with dementia and after hearing about Shelley's and Lorraine's research, I can make more sense out of my own experience. The losses that we experiences, experienced were many. They were persistent and unrelenting and significant. But this allowed grief to do its work. Grief prompted our family to manage the ongoing changes brought about by Judy's loss of memory, loss of self, and, and the loss of functioning by continually adapting to new needs, routines, and roles. I would agree that this is a constant renegotiation of balance. Sometimes it felt there was no balance, and at other times we were able to find that place where there was peace, we were safe, and we were managing. I have come to know that being out of balance is inevitable, but there are ways to find balance again, including support from family and friends, one's personal faith, awareness, and openness to constant change, and always maintaining hope. Whether it be the hope for a better day than yesterday, hope for comfort, hope for rest, I realize that hope is flexible, and hope is always there, but sometimes we have to search for it. For me personally, 
As I continue to deal with my feelings of loss and grief, I am finding my way by engaging in those things that I used to enjoy, such as painting, connecting with our family, friends, and neighbors, reading, and of course, reminiscing. Most importantly, I am finding peace and comfort in all the many memories Judy and I shared over the 60 years of our life together. And now, as I think about Judy, I recall the moments when she was beginning to drift into those dark recesses of her mind. At those times, I remember holding her hands and saying these three words, I love you. She would look at me and smile. Her eyes would sparkle. And I knew that she was not afraid of the dark, chaotic world in which she lived, at least momentarily. To conclude, I would like to read a poem which presents more succinctly the feelings and emotions which I believe are felt by all those who are impacted by dementia. It is a good reminder of those things or those aspects of caregiving that we as caregivers need to pay attention to and to honor. These include touch, presence, understanding, patience, acceptance, and love. Do not ask me to remember. Do not ask me to remember. Don't try to make me understand. Let me rest and know that you are with me. Kiss my cheek and hold my hand. I am confused beyond your concept. I am sad and sick and lost. All I know is that I need you to be with me at all costs. Do not lose your patience with me. Do not scold or curse or cry. I can't help the way I'm acting. Can't be different though I try. Just remember that I need you, that the best of me is gone. Please don't fail to stand beside me. Love me till my life is done. Thank you. So to end, I'd like to thank my dad for his presentation this evening. And we truly hope that you're able to take something from it. And um, at this time, we invite comments and questions and discussion. So thank you again for listening to our story this evening. And we look forward to talking with you. Thank you so much to all the presenters. Tonight, uh, Lorraine and Shelley, thanks for sharing your knowledge and experiences. Joel and Jill for being so courageous to share your powerful personal stories. Um, we will soon have the presenters take some more questions. If you haven't already done so, attendees, please type your questions in the Q&A and state who the question's for. Um, we'll have, no one else will see them um, that's attending tonight, just the uh, two moderators that we have. They'll read, summarize, and they'll ask the questions to the presenter shortly. Um, please keep your questions relevant to tonight's topic and the presentations you just viewed. Your question may be summarized or reworded for us to answer as many questions as we can. Um, just for a few minutes though, while you're typing your questions and thinking about them, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit more about the Alzheimer's Society in about four more slides and then we'll take the questions. So I'm just gonna share the screen with you.
Okay. So um, let's talk briefly about Alzheimer's Society um, research. Research funding moves us closer to um, life altering treatments, better care and cures for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Um, the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan funds research in partnership with Alzheimer's societies across Canada through the Alzheimer's Society Research Program, ASRP. Since 1989, the ASRP has invested over $64 million in dementia research. In 2020, the Alzheimer's Society invested in two new areas of focus, encouraging new researchers to explore radical new ways to advance our knowledge of dementia and improving the quality of life for people living with dementia, their families and caregivers. Research funded by the ASRP focuses on identifying potential new dementia medications, using brain imaging techniques to understand different forms of dementia, studying how diet and other lifestyle choices may delay, may delay the disease, and improving quality of life and care delivery in the community and in long-term care settings. The ASOS funds research in Saskatchewan in partnership with the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation, SHRF. Our focus is on research into finding treatments, causes and cures, and improving the quality of life for Saskatchewan people living with dementia. Also connecting people with lived experience of dementia with researchers who are conducting dementia related research. So currently funded projects with SHRF are um, the following, there's a couple here, led, the first one led by Dr. Megan O'Connell. The research project will test a virtual culturally safe monthly support group sessions for caregivers of Indigenous people with dementia improves their ability to cope. And I'll let you know about another one uh, led by Dr. Gary Groot and Dr. Carrie Nickelduff. For the research project, Indigenous caregivers will be given touchscreen tablets and small wireless routers that serve as a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot to be able to access special information and resources designed to help prevent burnout. We love the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan loves our donors. Currently three out of every four dollars for the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan uh, comes from donations. These donations come in during events, as sponsorships, gifts left in wills, monthly donations, or as general donations to the society. You were able to attend the evening of education today at no cost because of the generosity of a donor before you. We invite you to consider supporting our organization with a donation to truly make a difference for people in Saskatchewan who are living with dementia. And donations can be made online or by phone you'll receive a donation link in an email following the presentations tonight. With Alzheimer's, resource, with Alzheimer's Society resource centers across Saskatchewan, in the 2020-21 fiscal year, we provided service to 2,482 clients from 279 different Saskatchewan communities. Our shift to also offering virtual and online progr programming has increased our ability to provide additional um, programs to these communities. If you have questions about dementia, you need someone to talk to maybe about feelings that have, may have come up tonight, um, make sure to call the province-wide toll-free dementia helpline phone number Monday to Friday during regular business hours, or you also have the resource centers that you can reach out to. Okay, just uh, before we take questions, just a reminder that to view and register for upcoming Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan programs and events, you can go to the website listed on the slide. And let's go now to any remaining questions for our presenters. And I'm just gonna stop sharing here. Okay, we've got a couple. Um... Couple of questions here. The first one is um, actually, I'm going to start with this because it's saying this is not a question, but just to say thank you for opening your life and heart to us with your story, Jill and Joel. It's a journey that is ever changing. What is a good day is always changing with the changes in our loved ones. So thank you to that, um, to you guys for that. Um, 
one question, and I think anyone, uh, this is to Joel, I guess, and Jill, if she is available, I think she's sitting in an airport, so it might be a little noisy, but um, did you ever feel any anger through this? You talked about hope a lot, but wondering if you, if you felt anger. So Joel, if you don't mind answering that question, if you have any comments about that. Yes, yeah. Get you to turn your camera, I'll just turn your camera on or if you can. There you are. Yeah. Yes, I I don't don't recall being angry about anything at all. Um I guess my personality is such that I have learned to accept things without bothering to question why, because I think that's circuitous and it comes back to the same old question, why me or why us, which leads to anger. Um, I think I, I felt more frustration because I, I was not the changes in Judy's uh, emotional and physical health. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. And I believe from the people to whom I have spoken, who have uh, to provide care for their spouses or their families and friends, it's one of the things that they say that is quite uh, common amongst those kinds of, you know, while all of these uh, um, health areas are available, um, it's strange that, and I am an avid reader, I like to read all kinds of things. Um, I did not know what to expect. So I fumbled my way through and perhaps that was a good thing because it never let me feel angry about it doing things for Judy. I was too preoccupied with trying to figure out what come next. And, I, and from what I've heard is that these caregivers are feeling the same, that what starts, what, is it, what does it look like? And what is going to come next? And what can I do about that change? That's what they say they want to know. And I was preoccupied with that. And so I think it alleviated a possibility of anger. Thank you. Um, that sort of leads to the next question. Another one for you, Joel. Um, what, this person's wondering, given the knowledge that you've gained through this experience, what advice would you wish to give others or the people that are here tonight um, that, you would have liked to have done differently if you had the insight that you have now? Yeah, well, I think um, whenever the, the uh, problem occurs at the very beginning, and there's this obvious change in memory especially, people should not hesitate to go for a professional help and seek out those um, agencies that provide help in finding the help that they need. See, I thought that I knew Judy well and I could do a far better job of anybody else. They don't know what she likes. They don't know what she, when she sleeps or what is it she does during the, I knew all of that. And foolishly, I just thought I could do it all. And that was the predicament that I had to face when I was hospitalized for 12 days. Yeah. That's, that's uh, one thing. And I, I'm going to use these abstract terms, but you know what they are. Patience. Take for instance, the incessant questioning. It, it gets annoying. It's the same thing. Why did you, so who is that? And what is she doing there? And whose car is that? And 
Why did she park the car over there? And same question over and over again. It requires patience. And then love and companionship. Those two, you know, they, I found that um, Judy was especially afraid to be alone. It got to the point where she didn't want to sit in a room by herself. She did not want to look at TV or, or read a book that she loved doing by herself in a corner in a, one of the rooms. Uh, she was afraid. She loved going out for coffee. And if we did, the questions will be something like this. Um, where is the entrance door? Do you know why? She was afraid. This was a new surrounding for her at that stage. At first she enjoyed it, but now it became a real problem for her. So she sat on a chair and she looked for the entrance door because she was afraid of being in this new environment, completely afraid. Um, so again, to understand that these people go through all these different st stages and knowledge about them is paramount in dealing with them. Uh, so love and patience, uh, uh, two things, uh, and companionship, being close, holding a hand or a shoulder or a hug, they all mean a lot. So, um... These two questions sort of go together. Um, talking a little bit about um, earlier diagnosis, you made reference to asking the doctor a couple of times about Judy's dementia. Looking back at that, is there ways you think you could have uh, sought, found or gotten the diagnosis earlier? And what did the well, what did the memory clinic look like when you did get there? What was that experience like? The, um, well, the first question, um, once a person recognizes that there's this memory loss, I would say, do not hesitate to go and get some professional help, wherever that might be. Doesn't matter if your doctor does not want to, uh, um, what do you call that uh, when you the doctor sends you to a specialist the referral a referral right thank you no worries yeah if the doctor is unwilling to do that then i would suggest that uh, you get a different doctor if you're sure that the spouse or the person is um surely losing his or her memory. I, I would say that early early treatment is important. It would it would not cure the disease or the illness, but it would certainly be able to um, delay the onset of complete memory loss. Um, I, and the second part of the question was? The second part was about the, the diagnosis when you did get to the, uh, refer to the memory clinic. What did that look like? Oh, yeah, that was uh, really, quite, yes, it was uh, quite frightening in a way because you come with a particular problem. You're in a strange place and you do not know what to expect. So that alone becomes a very frightening thing for anyone. And, um, you know, you get the people who are very helpful. I must say my experience, our experience has been one in which the people were there were very helpful and prompt. And so they came, but, you know, they walk around with these files and you see these files and you begin to wonder, I wonder what's in that and why are the files so thick? And, and so you try to relate that to the spouse's illness and become, it becomes another fear. And so while that was the case, uh, the uh, medical professional, uh, the psychiatrist, I think, 
think she was, uh, was so very professional, helpful and down to earth and didn't scare you or, you know, talk at a level that you could understand. So it was a good experience overall. Joel, we're going to give you a little break here. I have a question for Lorraine or Shelley. Okay. Yeah. Um, can Lorraine or Shelley, can you offer any thoughts or advice on the guilt felt when one sends a family member to long term care? Maybe I can hand that to Shelley. <laughs> That's a tough one, but what do you think, Shelley? You know, all along the journey of dementia, it is punctuated by different events and they all are associated with loss. And certainly the decision to have your relative go to long-term care is one of the most significant. And it's only natural to feel badly and think maybe things could be different or what if I you know, could have kept them at home longer. But at the end of the day, some people require so much support that is just not physically possible. And, and certainly that was the case for Joel. In fact, you know, it, it harmed him physically because of the amount of care. So I think people have to be kind to themselves and they do the best that they can, but it is, it is a particular, it, it is a significant loss. And there, there is work that you have to do to sort of negotiate that within within yourself and and rebalance and find a different um, relationship with your relative. Some some people have told me after you know things settle down and and their relative is you know doing well in a home and they see that they're cared for. Um, you know I've had friends say I became my mother's daughter again because I wasn't having to do intensive care for her and those sorts of things. So when they visited, it was more like they were mother and daughter again. So it takes time to, you know, rebalance those things, but it's, it's impossible for people to care 24 hours a day on their own in their own home. It, it, it's, so you have to be, I think, just nicer to yourself. And it is a absolutely significant, huge loss. And it needs to be recognized that way. And it's, it is perfectly fine to feel guilty. That's okay. And caregivers are, are so committed, right? And yeah. so attached and, and devoted to the person that they've been looking after. And I think Joel was saying that too, even why he was reluctant to go to the doctor, because he knew what, you know, she loved the best, right? He knew what she liked to do and where she liked to sleep and what she liked to eat and all those things. And then to realize you need some help with that, that's hard, right? You're, um, but it comes to that point, you know? We have a couple other just comments, uh, thanking again, folks for sharing your story and whatnot. And I have one other question for, it's, it says for Lorraine, but I think Lorraine or Shelly, um, you could, either one of you could answer this is how, you know, be looking at, you know, ambiguous loss, how do you help the person with dementia cope with the losses that they're experiencing? Yeah, right, Jill. Yeah. Rock, rock, paper, yeah. scissors, whichever one. That's right. Well, and, and uh, because, well, I've, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I have the expertise to say for sure, but I'm sure that, um, you know, a, a person with dementia goes through the journey too, right? And uh, experiences the losses and they're probably even more ambiguous <laughs> because even getting that diagnosis, I think that Joel was saying with that day, you remember that day so clearly, right? Just receiving the diagnosis and then it's ambiguous loss, but it's also lots of anticipatory grief, right? Maybe Joel can speak to this too. He's Any comments, Joel, on how you helped Judy 
through the disease as well, how did you help her cope with the losses that she was experiencing? Well, the, the tendency of a caregiver is to do, do things for the person who is ill. You want to do everything, maybe to save time, uh, whatever, but that's the tendency. And sometimes that's not so good because some of the things that uh, the people suffering from dementia could do, we take over those responsibilities. And I, I don't know, but I presume that this doesn't help you much. What does it require? So the person who is ill is having troubles putting on a shoe, let's say. And so you want to put it on to save time. Let's get it over with and, and go about our business. But this person may not even recognize that it's a shoe. As Judy did not recognize eggs on a plate or whatever, it's not that she didn't like that. It's because she was unable to recognize what that object was because dementia had gone so far that it resulted in this inability to recognize things. And so what I learned after a while was to um, help the person by taking a hand and uh, putting the shoe close by, taking a hand and putting it on the tongue of the shoe, showing her how to pull it up. And she do the other one correctly. And so I think that helps in ways to get uh, um, the person who is ill to try to do something. I'm not sure. I don't have the research to back what I'm saying. I'm just going by my personal experience with my wife and some of these difficulties that she had. So I would say it's a matter of being patient, a matter of uh, helping them. There are two kinds of these uh, people with these illness, the illnesses, the compliant ones, like Judy was. So you asked her to do something and she'd do it. She wouldn't volunteer to do it, but if you were to help her out by showing her what to do, she'll do the task. And then they're the ones who are not comply and they cuss. They have never sworn before. And I've seen those ones uh, on my journeys to the uh, care home. It's where you would think that you were listening to a, a sailor with them cussing. And belligerence was another uh, characteristic of some of them. So I was very lucky in order to have one who was compliant and would do things that you asked. So, you know, there are all these complications and one has to be, I say that the best thing is patience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the stages in which these uh, sorts of things occur. So one could anticipate them. One could at least know a few things that you can do and, Oh, and the rest of it has to do, of course, with what I talked about before was the business of being close, being able to touch the person, um, hug and love above all else. I think it conquers everything in the soul the same. Goes. That's true. Thanks, Joel. Um Another question for Shelley or, or Lorraine. Um, for in a case of say an adult child that's supporting um, a, a, a parent and a spouse and there's a loss in the family, how, um, with your hands full, it's difficult to manage the loss and grief of others. Do does anyone have suggestions or either of you have suggestions or strategies to offer in how do you balance the needs of, of the, say, an adult child who's continuing to care for 
a, a parent or a spouse when they've lost when they've lost a parent or a, a, a spouse. Well, it definitely we're all connected, right? And we all have different relationships. And so even within, I know that um, Jill also has gone through a grief journey, right? And they've supported each other. And actually, I think this experience, even Jill and Joel of making, of sharing their story and, and um, making the video even has been a way that they've supported each other's grief too, right? It's almost like um, a way to make meaning of it and to remember what you went through and to remember the person and the experience and to support each other and the, and the family. And that actually takes me to one last question and it is for Jill if she's able to answer. Um, and it's, you know, through all of this, Jill, you were supporting your dad and your mom and what kind of support, where did you find support or as this person put in here, who was your leaning post? <laughs> She's raised her hand there. I did. There we go. There you there go. She is. There there you are. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Jill. Thank you so much. And sorry for this confusion here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Good. Good. I did answer in, in the post or the chat, oh, okay. but I did I did want to add that I think it was very much family and friends that like like it's been said that's sort of supported us through the whole process. And so my leaning post was very much family and friends. And I said, including both Lorraine and Shelly. Mm -hmm. So I had experts actually to help me, which was very nice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but other things too, like having hope and having faith. And sometimes after a, a tough day or visit, just going for a walk, and sort of making meaning as Lorraine said, and sort of going through the experience that day or that week and thinking it through. But mainly I think I would say family, um, like my dad and uh, friends for sure. So that's, that's what I found helpful. Somehow a way to share the journey, isn't it, right? Share the, share the grief, you know, you can't do it alone. And even I, there's probably many people here too that are still really suffering with grief and loss. And, you know, you need to share it with somebody, your friends, your family, your doctor, your reach out to the dementia, to the Alzheimer's society and get some help. So important. Share the journey. You, you know, grief, do it is, grief is hard work. And, and so you can't necessarily you know, parcel it and grieve all at once and think that you're done. Sometimes you have to work at it a little bit and then put it aside for a while and then go back to it, but it will catch up eventually. So I think you need, it helps if people give themselves permission to be sad and um, work through their feelings of loss and so on, and then find other ways to make meaning. But it's hard when you are responsible for a parent and maybe a spouse and you're in this caring and you're experiencing losses in all kinds of ways. Um, it's important to be kind to yourself, but recognize it, it is hard work and sometimes you're just not ready to do it. This and so I'm okay. Well, and I think at that point, Jill, you know, we're at a point here where we're going to have to. Uh, Close for questions. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Karen, but before she takes over, I just wondered if any of the four of you had sort of the, the some last words. I guess I'd say just um, thank you for this opportunity. I think it's so important just to think about the grief that people have experienced in this time and through caregivers and how much harder it's been through the pandemic and then you know how much how much extra help you need to get through and to make sure you're reaching out to get the help that you need don't try to do this on your own
Okay, thank you so much. Our time is up for the evening. Um, I would once again really like to thank all of our presenters um, tonight and all of you for attending um, tonight's evening of education, as well as my colleagues Carly, Connie and Jennifer for assisting in the background and with questions. And that was really appreciated. There will be an evaluation sent out um, to all via email soon um, with additional resources such as the Alzheimer's Society resource called Ambiguous Loss and Grief in Dementia um, and other information. We really appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete the evaluation and your feedback is um, really important to us and helps us improve future events. Our next evening of education will be October 26th from 7 to 9 p.m. And it's titled Self-Compassion, an Umbrella for Our Rainy and Snowy Days, presented by Dr. Donna Goodridge. And you can register at the website that I showed on the last screen and you'll um, see it in your presentation as well. Um, and find it on our Alzheimer's Society website under programs and events. Uh, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thanks again. Thank you.